All right, Grace, I think we're probably ready to go. So I'll turn it over to you to, to kick us off. Okay, thank you, Matt. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. This is one of our membership services uh, webinars that uh, is being delivered today by uh, Gifford Car Insurance, one of our newest preferred supplier members. As you know, the value proposition and member service is most important to the association. Um, Insurance has been an issue um, that has concerned the industry for a number of years. The association continues to identify where we can be of help in providing education and information. And uh, Joanne, our president, is here today as an integral part of this uh, webinar. And at this point, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Perfect. Thanks, Grace. And thank you uh, very much for your stewardship and your your tenure over the many years and congratulations on your upcoming retirement. So everything that you've done for the, the Resorts Ontario program has been uh, very much appreciated by, I'm sure, by all the members and uh, the warm welcome as a new preferred supplier has been uh, very much appreciated on our part. So thank you very much. Our pleasure, Matt, thank you. So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Matthew Carr, I'm the president of Gifford Carr Insurance Group. Uh, we've done a few a few of these types of webinars in different industries, and we're excited about this one because um, hopefully the rain stops here very shortly and we get into enjoying the summer. And uh, uh, many of what uh, what we're here to talk about and and having fun versus the the technical pieces and the the the, the risk management side of things. But with me today, I have Bernie Robertson, who's our branch manager up in North Bay. Um, he's had a very long-standing career in the industry, uh, including some history with the resorts program for well over 30 years. Uh, and I've got uh, Joanne Snyder, as uh, Grace mentioned, the current president of Resorts Ontario. Uh, she's currently the general manager of Beachwood Resort for over 30 years. Um, and yeah, so I'm happy to, uh, to, ha to have everyone here today. And it looks like we've handed out a couple of uh, panelists uh links so that's why we've got a few different graces here on the panelists so uh for those of you who aren't part of the panel if you don't mind turning off your camera and that would be much appreciated um I've, kathleen's going to put up a poll here though for those participating and attending uh which is just to address what are your what is your biggest concern uh as it relates to insurance within a resorts uh program right now uh we pretty well know what they might be but i'm interested to see what the uh, the biggest topic is um, for the attendees right now. So I'll put that up for their, for 30 seconds and see if everyone can put that through. Hopefully insurance isn't keeping everyone up at night, but I know it does in some ways because it's generally misunderstood. So I'll give it another 10 seconds or so and then we'll close it off. All right, Kat, you're good to, uh, to shut down, not shut that down and see the results. Not so surprising pricing. <laughs> and I mean, that, that probably captures a lot of what uh, we're hearing across the industry, but, um, and, and multiple industries, but obviously it has a ripple down effect throughout um, all of your operations. Um, Joanne, I'm gonna flip it over to you. And I mean, we saw the, the, the pricing, the capacity, the, the operation challenges, but from an operator standpoint, could you, speak to the challenges that the that you're facing right now from an insurance perspective yeah thanks matt um i know speaking on on my my resort property alone um we had quite an eye-opener experience last year when our insurance came up for renewal in june um of course it kind of slips away from you sometimes when you start the shopping process and um all of a sudden you get your renewal and then they give you the price just before your your time up your timeline is up, and we saw our insurance go up sixty percent, which was quite a huge jump. Um, not only did we see it go up sixty percent, we saw less coverage. Um, so there was uh, quite a few exclusions that they put in there. We had to try and figure out very quickly what we needed, what we didn't need, 
and and make it a little bit more manageable. Um, it was a big big chunk of cash to uh, to see an increase of, and and that in and of itself kind of made us go, hey, we gotta we gotta get a better handle on this, and so we're here, and this is where you're going to help us. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah, absolutely. That's <laughs> that's our that's our plan. But you you brought up a couple of different things there. Not only was the pricing increase. Um, something of a concern, but the time it was delivered, your renewal mm -hmm. timing, um, you know, the, the limitation of coverage. Uh, so there's, there's sort of three or four things in there that we can unpack here and I'll flip it over to Bernie to sort of, maybe we'll pick off a couple of those Bernie and, and talk to the challenges that we've seen in the industry for those exact, those, uh, those topics and how we've been able to, to address them. Well, <clears throat> just to bring everybody up to speed, I mean, the, one of the biggest things is renewal timing. I mean, why would you ever want to have your renewal date within your busiest time of the year or at the start of your <clears throat> of your resort uh, being full of guests? I mean, why would you want to deal with insurance at the same time? Um, I have the same conversation with companies that have their renewal date on their year end, which is, again, it just creates another layer of complexity because there's the constant, well, I'm worried about my getting my financials done, but at the same time, I'm trying to give information to my broker so he can give me a quote. So it just moving off your current expiry date. So the programs traditionally run at a certain time. It'll be May 30, June 30, or August 30. But once again, insurance can be, dates can be moved. Um, it's not static. And so the request can be made to move it. So it's outside of your expiry date. The one good thing is that traditionally, if you have it in the June 30, for example, you've got cash flow. So again, it's much easier to pay that bill when you've got cash flow versus having your renewal in say March 30th when you're not even open yet. So you got to put that money aside. So that's one of the items I think we can help you with is that to have that discussion about what is the best time for you as a resort owner or property owner or manager to move that date to. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely different options there. Um, Talking about, you know, very much a technical piece of the insurance side of things, Bern, can you talk about uh, Joanne's concern about, you know, basically she got stuck with a bill the last minute um, with a, a massive increase and sort of talk to the market, uh, some of the challenges and, and how, what, what really should happen in that situation? Well, the program type of account, if you're part with one insurer, one set of rules, one set of rates and one common expiry date with the entire group in the program, you're kind of tied into that, um, that offering. But the problem is that the broker traditionally will know three to six months out after the contracts have been renewed in England, for example, at Lloyd's, that there's going to be rate increases coming down the pipe. So our position is that we need to be out front and to let everybody know that while it's not great news, that your rates are going up, um, that the, you get out front of it. You be very uh, transparent. I mean, that's part of the insurance industry is transparency. The other problem is that when we start seeing new exclusions being added for operations, I mean, obviously um, COVID was a one in a hundred year event. And just like Y2K back, everybody remembers back in 2000 when they excluded anything to do with data because of the Y2K issue. So the insurance companies react by adding exclusions. So the COVID exclusion is here to stay. Um, I don't think we're ever going to see that disappear. And, but at the same time, um, there's no reason why the broker should be very transparent with you three months in advance, at least saying, okay, here's what we're seeing. It's all about having that intelligent conversation with the resort owners. For example, you have your AGM in March. That's the perfect opportunity to have that discussion on mass with the group is to say, here's what we're seeing, here's what we're gonna be looking at this year, and potentially bringing other partners into the relationships so you're not just looking at one program, one price, one renewal date. Joanne, you talked about the limitation of coverage and how um, at the last minute, you know, you're having to change your operations. What effect did that have on your entire season? Um, when that news was delivered or, or have you heard from members who, uh, you know, if something was excluded, how, what kind of effects that's had on, you know, the year ahead and how much you've had to pivot at the last minute? 
Yeah, um, a lot of a lot of the pivoting was um, was reducing guest services, for example, um, with the uh, ski boat, if you're operating a ski boat or even your boat rentals and, um, you know, just limiting our our liability as much as we can um, so that we're, we're making sure that we have coverage. But we were doing a lot of um, there's a lot of quick questions being being asked um, as far as as far as that went, like, what can we you know, uh, we we pivoted. We decided that you had to have a boater's license to limit our liability a little bit more. Uh, we were no longer issuing the temporary uh, boater's licenses for for our boats. We wanted somebody with a little bit more experience in it, and um, and we felt that would that would help our our liability level when we got the insurance. Did did you or members have backlash as a result of the changes that you would have had to make? You know, someone who might have. Uh, I've, I've already had a booking, sort of had an expectation of what they were, were signing up for early in the season, only to find out when they get there that sort of, you know, things have changed because, you mm -hmm. know, things out of your control. But, you know, what, what was that backlash? And speak to that a little bit, if there was. We had a little bit of backlash, not too much, because we knew moving forward that we were doing this. Um, we did send out emails to those who had advanced bookings um, that this is a requirement now. Here's the link. Here's how you get your boater's license. Um, be prepared. There were a few people who were not prepared, and some of them actually, um, you know, figured out how how to get somebody with a boater's license. And then we did make a couple of exceptions, but um, but not too many. And that was more to do with um, our international guests, uh, because that's you know they can't get a boater's license in Ontario, uh, is my understanding, or they can, but it's just not in their in their wheel realm at that point. Bernie, that brings up a, a big topic from an insurance perspective. Um, when you've got owner operators who are limited um, based off the insurance standpoint, you know, when we come in at the last minute and say, you know, your limit, your operations are limited and then they've got to pivot, what kind of exposure does that then leave them when you've got an international guest or someone like that who, you know, uh, they're making exceptions and, you know, that coverage may or may not be there. Well, again, that's the the insurance policy dictates the terms and as one of our former colleagues that just retired this year, um, our job is to read the policy wording because again, it dictates the terms and conditions that you're under. So uh, Joanne, by making um, any changes or uh, an exception, you're actually in violation of the insurance contract and potentially could expose the resort and yourselves personally to liability. So again, it's it's really tough when you're being, when you're trying to do the, what's right for the customer, which is the end result, the same thing with us, we're trying to do what right by our customers, priority number one. But if you have to make exceptions to the rule, which it can potentially expose the, the company to liability. So it's, it's kind of tough from the broker's perspective, especially if the broker, again, because it's a program account and it's been with the same underwriting team and all of a sudden they've changed the rules. There are certain restrictions that need to, and timelines that need to be addressed. So in other words, you need to be, get notice in the event that there's a substantial change to the policy document or a restriction that's being added. You need to get notified in advance of renewal, not just at renewal time. Yeah, there's statutory restrictions on our professional obligations to get that information to you. So um, bang on. Bernie, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, the insurance market and some of the capacity issues and some of the challenges over the last couple of years and, and sort of how the tide has turned um, most recently and, and why this is, you know, a program and a, an opportunity for us to, uh, to help operators? Well, first of all, I mean, obviously, in 2020, we were shut down for an extended period. There was a lot of uh, capacity issues in the marketplace at that time. Um, some of the insurers had um, policies that had actual loss sustain business interruption coverage that uh, they potentially had to honor. Um, so there was a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace at the time in 2020. And of course, you're open and you're working on capacity limits of maybe 30%. You're not driving the same revenue. Your expense burden is probably pretty close to the same as it was in 2019 before COVID actually hit. And then, of course, the insurance market, we start seeing a lot of large property losses, natural disaster losses that hit the marketplace. 
So it just, once again, it's the perfect storm. So you've got um, a world economic uh, interest rate set very low levels. You've got property losses that are in the billions of dollars from natural disasters in North America and worldwide. And then you put a COVID on top of that. So it just created the perfect storm. And the insurance companies, unfortunately, they're just like anybody else. They have shareholders and they have to make a profit. So again, how do they address that is through either underwriting or through rate increases. So they either underwrite out the pieces that are going to be unprofitable for them. So like in Florida right now, good luck buying flood coverage. It's almost impossible. So that's what's happening in North America is that companies are restricting their capacity or they're putting it in areas where they know that they're not going to get the natural disaster losses. So there's so many different variables on this, but it's really difficult for me to say, but I would say those are the big three that are what is driving rate and capacity issues right now. Yeah, absolutely. And a tough class of business to start with, no question. Uh, Joanne, I want to ask you what your expectations are when it comes to renewal time, specifically around your operations. What are you expecting from you know, your advisor, your business partner, essentially, um, risk managers to come out and, you know, what, what, what's your expectation? What do you think your membership is looking for from um, a partner and, and someone who's helping with this, with significant line item on your, your P&L? And yeah, maybe I'll talk a little bit about that. Thanks. Um, I think what, uh, what we definitely, as, 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 a, as an industry, are looking for is a, a little bit more clarity um, from the insurance companies. We find a lot of times we don't get direct answers. And I know sometimes, and it's almost like politicians speak, we'll just keep talking in circles and circles and circles until you get tired and, and go away. Um, you know, we just want to know, are we covered? Are we not covered? If we make a claim, what's that going to do to our rates? If we don't make a claim, what's that going to do to our rates? You know, um, you know, we kind of feel like we're walking this, this very fine line of, you know, we don't want to ask a question to the insurance company because that's going to get our, our, our risk up. And then the underwriters are going to say, oh, you know, there's a higher risk up here because they're asking these questions. Um, I think just being able to ask the questions without penalty or without feeling like we're going to have a penalty in, in, imposed upon us. Um, and, um, and getting, like you, like you said, Bernie, getting those notifications months and months ahead. If you know these big increases are coming down the line, you know, let's let's start uh, picking the Band-Aid off just a little bit at a time instead of ripping it off and having this gusher of blood happen, um, you know, so that we can plan better. We can, we can make our rates according to what we know um, and help our P&L at the end of the day. Um, and the other thing is um, site visits would be very welcome. And, um, but not when we're trying to get everything up and running and, and welcoming guests. And, you know, there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of large properties out there uh, who may be on this webinar, but there's a lot of small properties that are just, you know, partners or, you know, um, they're, you know, the mom and pop or organizations, the family run businesses that we're doing many, many jobs all at the same time. And it's really difficult to try and slate a whole day to, to um, having the insurance company come out. Um, and then the other thing is presenting lots of offers as opposed to just saying, here's the best offer. How about giving us a few choices um, so that we can choose uh, what works for us? You know, we might want more coverage in one area than the other and not necessarily do the uh, insurance brokers know know those things but we'd like some options yeah I, I think that's a that's a fair request if there are said options mm -hmm. um, but the ability to have that conversation to at least address those potentials um, is of the utmost importance in the transparency piece from the get-go really or the relationship um, Matt can I jump in for a sec I just think absolutely. Joanne the site visit thing speaks loudly to the Renewal date. So again, if we have the site visits outside of the uh, busy startup time in May, June, obviously, before you invite your guests and have that renewal push to September 30th, and all of a sudden it just it creates a whole different level of um, 
and it's not traditionally a day. I mean, if I if I had to take a day to do every single inspection, it would be uh, it would take me a long time to cover everybody off. But again, I mean, to try to um, within our team to be able to come to each location because we do think it's important to, because it's our job as brokers to bring all relevant information to the underwriters and to actually visit with the the risk, view the housekeeping, ask about uh, contractual waivers, ask about all these other things. But there's an agenda and there's also a, it's shared with you before we actually come on site. So you're not sitting there scrambling, looking for documents when we're actually there. Yeah, good point, Bernie. I mean, the relationship and the partnership piece is sort of what I'm trying to drive home uh, in terms of, of how we like to operate. But um, what other issues, I mean, and we've talked about you know, the big ones for sure, Joanne, but as an operator, what other issues are you, do you see um, that the insurance program, your insurance partner can, can assist with that you may or may not be getting right now? Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, to pinpoint any one specific thing, I'm, I'm uh, a little like, I'd have to kind of be digging in the back of my brain on, um, but, you know, we don't, um, you know, speaking, speaking on my own property and through my own insurance, um, and I and I get that that insurance companies and brokers are busy. They're busy dealing with things. But um, you know, perhaps a little reach out every now and then with a phone call as opposed to an email. Um, I appreciate that you know they understand we're busy, but um, you know perhaps you know a little bit more, a little bit more communication um, from from our from our partners that we're we're paying these wonderful dollars to that uh, you know we don't see claims on. And I do get that, you know, um, you know, insurance insurance brokers and uh, insurance companies tend to be thrown under the bus like lawyers. You know, nobody likes them, but we need you. Uh, <laughs> but I must say, I do like you, Bernie, and I do like you, Matt. So, yeah, well, I appreciate uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> it, so, it is it is a constant battle that we're we're sort of trying to change the uh, the perception of the industry, and it, I say that as a as a very large undertaking because this is much larger than. The, the four of us on the panel today, but uh, uh, it is something that uh, I, I feel strongly about with our team to say that it is still a relationship business and it's still important to understand exactly the challenges that you're going through. And um, I may not have the best news all the time, but I can mm -hmm. at least explain it to you and hopefully soften the blow and, and work with you to understand and, and make that, that a little bit more palatable. So, um, Bernie, you, I'll sort of throw the same question to you. You've worked on, in this, this field before. Um, what other challenges do you see that the, the resorts owner, the resorts program, the, uh, that, that they're facing right now that can be addressed? Well, I think what we're seeing is that, again, property seems to be the, the driver. Um, we seem to be, from the risk management perspective, um, resorts that are Again, uh, getting older, um, we're finding that anything that's over a certain vintage, the, the insurance companies are asking for complete updates. So not just um, some, the, when was the roof last done? They're asking to see all updates. So they wanna see plumbing, electrical, um, heating source, and they wanna see these, these updates because again, they're, they're going back to their actuaries and actuaries are saying, okay, if it's over 60 years old, chances are you're gonna lose it. So we wanna make sure that we're capturing enough premium for losses, future losses. So that's kind of what they're looking at. Um, liability seems to be relatively constant um, based on your operations. I mean, obviously the guest experience, you want to provide as much as you can so that your guests enjoy their, their time there. Because again, let's face it, water sports is, as Joanne said earlier, is probably one of the biggest drivers uh, for a majority of your facilities. Um, so by having restrictions and coverage for those areas that doesn't really make much sense. So, but what we're finding for the insurance companies again is that if they don't understand something, they have a tendency to exclude it. So if they don't understand the exposure or they're new in the industry or they've been around for a long time and they just want to um, do something, if it's one set of, again, back to what I said earlier, Matt, if it's one company, one set of rates, one set of rules and one program, then you're at their mercy. So our, thought process on this is that we want to have a panel of different carriers that we can go to and we don't necessarily need to have 
one specific carrier that will all be on every single account because the accounts vary in size and complexity. That we go to the marketplace with all the relevant information and we use the appropriate carriers and the appropriate company at that for the, each individual. So you're not being treated as a number, but you're being treated as an individual risk. Yep. Which makes more sense to us. Yeah, absolutely. Jemaine, I wanted to get back to, you said something earlier about feeling like there was a penalty about asking questions. Can you give yeah, me sort it, of an example or sort of what you're getting at with that piece? No, no example, um, like a, a specific example, but just if you're asking a question like a, a what if um, question, you know, what if this happened with a guest or what if this happened to our property? What if we uh, remedied it ourselves, you know, um, knowing what our, our deductions are, you know, kind of looking at should we be putting in a claim? You know, what's the deduction? Yeah. Um, you know, things like that. And it tends to uh, perk the ears up on the underwriters. And then they're like, oh, well, wait, you made an inquiry this way. So we're going to be excluded, you know, if this was a problem, say a water problem or a flooding problem, for example, and you had an inquiry about it, it kind of, they, it, it you, you kind of sense that they're piquing their interest to it and they may exclude or have some type of condition as an addendum um, in your next in your next policy update. So th this might be my biggest plug of the entire webinar, but isn't that the role of the broker? Isn't that our role to be the partner so that you can call me and say, Matt, take off yeah. your insurance broker hat for half a second yeah. here. And you know, what do you think from a business perspective? You know, yes. what do we do here? And then it's 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 on me, it's on us to know what effects that may or may not have on your policy. Um, I think of some other, uh, I have some friends, but also other clients who are in similar industries. Um, they're notorious for calling me on a Friday afternoon saying, hey, what if we do this? And it's halfway built, but it's, you know, what is it? And I, I think that's something, again, uh, back to what I talked about in terms of the relationship piece, you have to have the comfort in the, the yeah. uh, with us as your broker, but as the, uh, as the partner mm -hmm. to know that we know what we're talking about when it comes to your operations, your, your challenges and, and how that responds. I say it often to my, a lot of my team and, and, and Bernie talked about it in terms of knowing what we're, what we're insuring and, and what the wordings are and how things apply. Oftentimes it's just a conversation. If I start going on about technical insurance terms, you tune me out 30 seconds into it because it's not what you do. I can walk around your property and, and identify risks and understand that. I'll jot down notes. But it may, it's not going to be the make, make or break in the entire situation. So um, I will use that opportunity as a plug. I don't like to, but um, that to me is absolutely our responsibility to make sure that that partnership is there so you feel comfortable to ask those questions. And what gets to the insurance company is only of utmost importance and is something that may affect your long-term coverage. Yeah. So we do have a question. We do have a question from the floor about electric, uh, electrical certificates. So was that from Grace or one of the other great uh, imitators? It looked, it, yeah, it looks like it was Grace, but it was really Heather Ford from Kingston, the one who had trouble getting on. Sorry <laughs> for my penis. Um, so I've dealt with the same insurance company forever. My rates went up, I get that. I'm happy to hear that my renewal date is, I think the end of October. So I'm in a better spot, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Somebody taking care of me to manage that for me because <laughs> I didn't know it could move. Um, so my question is last year, you know, I was reinsured, but there was this thing next year, you're going to need an electrical certificate. And when I've talked to people about that, it's looking like a thing that costs thousands of dollars to get. So I just wondered from your perspective, you know, is this something I can push back on a little like every electrical job we've done on site? has been all up to code and checked and all of that good stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm just asking about that. We are a property 60 plus years. We were built in 1955. Okay, amazing. Thanks, Heather. Bernie, I'll flip that one to you as the, uh, the expert in the field. How would you address the electrical certificate? Well, again, it's, there's gotta be context. I mean, if all of your, uh, Heather, all your renovations have been done to code and they're all done by a, a certified contractor that's, uh, and it's all been inspected and certified, there's no reason why it would require a certificate unless it was 
just from the um, the inspection. I just can't. The acronym hasn't come to my name right now, but there is a Electrical Cer uh, Safety Alliance (ESA). They're the ones that actually do the, the final certification. So maybe that's the one thing they're asking for, Heather. So it, it's something I definitely think we should take offline. I'd like to see what they actually sent you because then I can give you some advice a little bit better on that. So. If you want to drop me a line after this webinar, by all means, and just send me over a copy of what they forwarded to you, that I can provide some context once I have that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Heather, in, sorry, go ahead. It was an ESA, I think, is what they were requiring. But I haven't had anybody on site to do an inspection in a very, very, very long time. They asked me to take a bunch of pictures during COVID, and that's really the only thing that has happened. <laughs> Yeah, ultimately, it may be as simple as, as just providing the information on the updates that you have done and that they were done by a certified electrician who was able to sign off on it. Um, it may be as simple as that versus going through and actually having someone um, bring everything up to code, which would obviously be a, a significant undertaking. So um, there's different, I don't want to say it's a pushback thing opportunity, but it may just be a, a simple solution to meet the, the criteria that's being asked of you. Yeah, to be perfect. Well, yes, let's take this offline and because everybody doesn't need to hear my tale of woe. <laughs> oh, Heather, that's all good. This is all stuff that you're all, all going to face when you have older older buildings, when you have older structures. Even and, if you have a new build and you've got an older structure on the site, you're going to get the same question. So it's, it's relevant for everybody. Okay. All Absolutely. right. There was a, a question in the, uh, thanks for that, Heather. There was a question in the chat box about justifying the price increases, especially considering there were almost zero payouts during COVID. Bernie, if you don't mind, I'll take this one. Mm -hmm. And this is something that programs in general have had a challenge with. And I'll explain it for you know, the basic premise of insurance is the, the premiums of the many pay for the losses of the few. So if you look at the industry wide, you know, across industry, across different subsections, um, oftentimes when insurance companies look at their loss ratios and their profitability, they look at the entire portfolio, whether that's auto, property, liability, personal alliance, commercial, it doesn't matter. When you get into a program situation, you very much narrow that focus to the program and only the participants of the program. So if you've got a hundred resorts as part of a program and you know 98 of them are mom and pop shops, and then you've got two behemoths, and they're the ones driving the premium, or sorry, the losses. You know, time and time again, um, you're having major, major liability losses, or you have a major, major property loss, total loss. That affects the entire loss ratio for the entire portfolio. So while I don't know that there is some justification for some of the price increases that are out there, and I'm not going to sit here and defend those, there are different ways to approach how to mitigate those, those pricing increases. The market over the last number of years, I think it was 2018, Lloyds of London basically shut down their operations because they were so unprofitable that they had to, to cut capacity worldwide. Um, we've, we're still feeling the effects and, uh, after COVID here now where we're only starting to get a little bit of capacity back now, but the pricing, I don't know, is ever going to go back down. In many ways, brokers have done a terrible job. The industry has done a terrible job where we have the data we have the actuaries who it's literally their job to go out and price different risks. And yet we then sat back and said, well, we need to discount that. Well, we need to discount that. We need to discount that. So the loss is caught up to us. And that, again, is not a defense of why the pricing increases, but I hope I'm able to explain that a little bit um, as to what has happened over the last number of years. So... Um, again, in many ways, there's not a lot of defense for a 60 or 40 or, uh, percent increase. And it's certainly not something that we'd like to do. Um, there was another question here, uh, from, uh, from an uh, attendee, Bernie, can you comment on the class action lawsuits against the insurance industry? I'm guessing that re relates to COVID and, um, the business interruption pieces, um, again, I could take that one, but I, I, I don't think they're going to have much luck. <laughs> uh, no, I think recently in the um, Supreme Court in BC has already sh locked down the fact that uh, the business interruption by Aviva, Aviva has gone to the Supreme Court in British Columbia, and the British Columbia um, Supreme Court has sided with the insurance company on this, that the loss um, re directly related to actual loss sustained would not be upheld. So 
that's again, it has that's only a district superior court. So again, it could go to Supreme Court, Supreme Court of Canada. So we'll have to see how that plays out. But at this time, right now, um, there's no coverage available for COVID-related business interruption losses going back to when the pandemic started. So yeah, it's it's not um, ideal for the consumer. But if Aviva Canada, for example, had this very broad wording under the program with one of the program carriers that's out there currently, if they had to pay out on every single one of those losses, it would probably bury Aviva Canada. We don't want one of the largest Canadian um, insurance companies to default. So that's a big issue as well. Yeah, th there is significant issues around it. Um, knowing the wordings um, is that ultimately what business interruption is there is if you cannot continue your operations based on a physical loss to your property. Unfortunately, uh, in my view, the and th that of the insurance carriers is that the uh, the COVID pandemic or any communicable disease does not fall under a, a physical damage to your building. So that's where the, phys the, the difference was and that's where they're hanging their hats on the argument. Um, it's not necessarily what you'd want to hear, but that that is the intention of you uh, the the business interruption clause. Um, I think we addressed one question here in terms of the uh, less than a week notice uh, and purposely waiting to the eleventh hour to present news and renewals so that you can limit the ability to shop options. Bernie, can you maybe talk to about the you know the first to market or the challenges um, that a broker presents its or faces when uh, you know, there's multiple different brokers or sort of maybe even just explain our opportunity to go to those different markets to, 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 to open up the ability to shop, I guess, if you will. Well, that's great, Matt. Again, once again, once a site survey is done, then traditionally when the broker submits the relevant information to the underwriting um, company, the funny part is, is that if we submit to say, for example, four different carriers mm -hmm. and we come in and say, here's our, the package we'd like to get quote, quote on for the resort. And if some other broker has last year's information and submits that before I get in the door with our submission, even though I've been to your site and done whatever's required, that broker gets a quote and I don't. So yeah. it's, it's a bit of an industry issue um, that brokers block the marketplace so that other brokers don't have the opportunity to secure a quotation. Now, the only way to get around that is by having the um, broker that you want to deal with the one that's been transparent and providing you the information and the site survey is to assign the quote, that quote from a specific individual market that you know may be the best of the bunch. You have to get that letter or that quote authorization signed over. And it just creates a layer of complexity and it just makes this process very, um, am not amicable, it's kind of adversarial and, and it's not the best position to be in. So. I think what you have to do is you have to pick your broker, then trust that your broker is going to go to the marketplace, come back with all the relevant quotes or the options for you as a customer, and then you pick and choose what you want to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. It is absolutely that partnership piece and making sure you have the right partner in your place. You know, I, I relate us very much to a lawyer or accountant, financial advisor, whatever that may be. Um, from our standpoint, we hope to have your best, we do have your best interests at heart and are trying to make, trying to get as much information so that we can sell your risk um, at the best coverage, at the most competitive pricing for you and for the insurance companies so that your operations understand that moving forward. Um, Corey, you asked uh, if there were any business interruption cases that were paid out. Uh, no, uh, as far as I know, from a COVID standpoint, um, Again, it was very much denied across the board. Um, there were some programs out there that had um, some coverage on there, and that's what they're fighting for. Um, but realistically, um, unless there was physical damage to the property, the business interruption clause claims have been denied uh, almost universally across. And you've also seen every insurance carrier come out and explicitly now say communicable diseases is, is excluded um, in, in no uncertain terms. So I don't know that I have any examples of anything that was paid out unless there was physical damage to the, the operations. Um, you also asked about the amount of companies brokers can contact is there a limit of shops? 
um, I can take that one, Bernie, or, or you can touch on it, but I guess that goes to the different brokers and the, the, the carriers and, um, you know, the, the value that uh, scale and has, but I'll let you touch on that one first. Well, I mean, again, it uh, depends on the on the brokerage. I mean, some brokers uh, keep their their focus pretty narrow on the markets that they support because they have want to have those large volumes with those brokers or with those companies, so that they're when they need a favor, they can get it. So, being a large independent brokerage that we are, um, we have access to well over thirty companies. I'm aware of that that we can custom tailor something that meets your requirements. Um, we don't necessarily are hemmed in with just going to one carrier, one set of rules, one set of rates, as always. But it's about you. It's not about us. It's about presenting your account in the best light possible to the marketplace, as Matt mentioned. And once again, it's not always about the cheapest price because sometimes the cheapest option doesn't have the appropriate coverages, but it's about giving you options to pick and choose what you want, what you want to purchase. And that's where I think we're going to be different. Yeah, absolutely. Jeremy, you uh, and Bernie, this is one for you here. Jeremy had asked uh, or said one of the most frustrating things is the inconsistency. One year they're fine with something like a water trampoline, and next year it seems like there's the most dangerous thing they've ever heard of. Our resorts generally don't change much year to year, but the underwriters take taste for risk seems to change with the wind. As an industry that uses mass data and complex algorithms, it's frustrating not to worry every year what will be the next flavor of the month risk item. Can you touch on that one? It's, <laughs> it's a frustration for us as well, Jeremy, but hopefully Bernie can speak to that eloquently. Well, I mean, the underwriting, um, the problem is that when we get a really good underwriter we have a relationship with, they usually promote them to another role, so we have to train a new underwriter. So, I mean, it's very difficult for us to have any consistency with, with one um, company if they're constantly changing their underwriting team. So it, it creates a layer of complexity for us. But again, it's going back to when they ask the same question the following year, as you mentioned, Jeremy, it, it's frustrating because of course our applications are very specific. Um, our site surveys are gonna be very specific and there's not gonna be a lot of room for ambiguity on them asking for, well, we didn't know about it. Well, I'm sorry, did you not read the application that we spent half a day working on with the owner so that you knew, are very much aware of the risks that are associated with the account? Yep. So again, it's, it's a bit of a, a job for us as the broker to not only educate you, but also educate our underwriters because in a lot of cases, if they're really good, they get promoted to management and then we have to start over again. But, is, but that is our job. It's our it's yeah. our job to advocate on your behalf and collect collect the right data and have those conversations throughout the year, Joanne, as you talked about, to sort of say, you know, what are we doing? What are we? Uh, what's going on? Because your operations aren't stagnant. You're you're constantly changing. You're constantly updating things. Uh, hopefully, making capital improvements um, and going through it. And then Corey, I, I see what you're. I, I get your frustration in terms of the insurance industry, and they don't want to deal with, so they pass the buck. Um, in many ways, again, I don't know that's defendable in any way, but uh, I would say in many ways, it's just from a lack of understanding. And that is, is purely, um, you know, again, our opportunity to understand your operations, your risk, your challenges, that how they differentiate from anyone else um, within the program, within the industry. Um, it's, it, again, it, it's that education piece where, um, if someone says, oh, I've got a water trampoline, and then we actually have to assess the risk. Um, you know, what things you have you done in place to, to mitigate said risk? What, what are the operations? You could be a five-star operator, and we have to make sure that they understand that everything you're doing is to make sure that, you know, you're taking care of your business. Um, on the flip side, there is a, you know, a, a challenge out there to all op operators that while, um, you know, the best intentions are at heart. There are some people out there who just don't comply, don't uh, help in any way, don't update their 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 um, their operations, and in many ways, sometimes their claims or their their lack of attention does you know hurt an industry as a whole. So um, that is that is one thing I know from uh, uh, across the industry. I, I mean, we can look to. Um, I, I'll use the example, and it's a, it's, it's a good example, but a terrible tragedy of the Humboldt uh, truck transport. Well, there was a company who hired someone, didn't follow any rules, and we've been fighting for the last five years 
um, five years, is it 10 years? I can't remember. But um, ever since that accident, that has flipped the onus onto the operators to accurately handle their operations and the, the inspections on uh, those properties or the, the vehicles has completely changed how they do business for the better, but it came as a result of a complete tragedy. So it shouldn't be a pass the buck situation is what I'm trying to get to, but uh, in many ways it's an ignorance and, and a uh, lack of advocacy and communication, which is a challenge that is not universal to what you guys are dealing with in resorts, but almost across the board in insurance. So hopefully that, again, there's no excuse for a lot of what I'm saying, but uh, hopefully it addresses some of the concerns and, and maybe gives you an insight as to how we would deal with things a little bit differently. So two other things that I want to add in um, is that uh, in a lot of times uh, resort owners or business owners don't like sharing their financials uh, with third parties. Um, you also don't like sharing your capital expenditures that you plan on your resort over the next five years. But I found that through um, sharing your business plans or sharing those financial statements with the underwriters and they're kept proprietary with the underwriters and the broker, that that has a bearing on when you're dealing with an underwriter as well, because all of a sudden they see that you are providing, um, you do have a CapEx schedule that you want to do your capital expenditure over the next five years to upgrade your resort or to uh, redo your electrical or redo roofing. It speaks to the housekeeping portion of the account and it gives the underwriter some sense of um, reasonableness as, as to what upgrades are going to actually be accomplished. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, further question to that, Bernie. Um, when you are doing uh, renovations, for example, or repairs and maintenance, is it, um, I, I just was kind of jotting notes about keeping a list of the upgrades you've done, when you've done roofing, when you've done electrical. Um, and to Heather's point, getting, you've got a, an ESA certificate, putting that into a file for your insurance company. Um, just, it's a nice little checklist to have um, so that when the insurance company says, hey, we need all this stuff because we have an old property as well. And yep. we're going through that. We're having to provide photos. We're having to provide dates. And when was the furnace changed? When was the electrical panels changed? You know, all these things. And we had to really think about it like, oh, my gosh, when did we do that? So, you know, like it was, you know, you don't you're busy doing 16 different things. It becomes, you know, it's just one thing. So it makes it easier for us. Um, it would have been helpful if our if our broker had said, hey, you know, keep a list of this stuff. It's coming down the line. We didn't get that. So we had to um, kind of go through that last process last year. But um do you recommend like before doing renovations, before doing any repairs and maintenance, contacting uh, yourself or your broker, for example, and saying, hey, you know, I'm looking at doing this. Where is my biggest bang for the buck? Where am I going to, am I going to reduce any of my insurance costs by doing this? Is it going to increase my insurance costs doing this? Um, do you recommend something like that when you're doing a renovation project? Well, in most cases, when you're doing a renovation, I mean, you're, you're upgrading existing, um, risk. So what you're doing is that you're you're making it more palatable to the insurance company by doing an update. So to me, that not necessarily going to speak to rate, but it's definitely going to speak to availability of coverage. So again, you're not going to be, um, because again, if we have a 40 or 50 year old uh, facility that has limited updates, the rate that's going to be charged is going to be X. But if it's all updated, the rate's going to be Y. So again, it, it speaks, Joanne, to the um, the rateability of the account. So it, it, it goes back to, um, again, making sure that your updates are there. You've got the, and keeping a list. I mean, that's, that's a pretty simple um, tool because again, the surveys that are done every year um, are kept on file and can be, so when we send you the survey for the following year or do it on site with you, we provide you a copy of last year. So you're not reinventing the wheel. So you're just basically looking at it saying, okay, how do I compare last year to this year, revenue, operations, property? Would it not make sense to have a, something from last year to be able to refer to? Because in a lot of cases, what you'll get is the blank application with maybe your name on the top and that's sent to you. And that drives all my clients insane. <laughs> There's nothing yeah. worse than blank applications. Yeah. Joanne, another piece of advice that I would say for all members and um, 
the importance of keeping all the information of the capital expenditures that you put in is if, if and when you go to sell the, the business, the resort, you'll need all that information from a reduction of taxation. If you're going to, you know, from a capital gain standpoint, if you can say that over the last X amount of years, you've invested, you know, considerable amount of money, it changes your purchase price from what you paid for it, you know, 60 years ago, potentially to, you know, you've invested all that money throughout. So I, by no means am I an accountant, but I've sold a couple of properties and had to deal with uh, capital gains and, um, the more you can show from a capital expenditure standpoint will reduce your taxation on exit. So that's, I mean, just from a pure business standpoint, uh, an important reason. But of course, anytime um, speaking to um, speaking to the pricing standpoint there, if you're priced appropriately now on a value of something that's $100,000, let's say a cabin, and then you were... Um, and then you upgrade said cabin and it's now worth $250,000, obviously the price is going to change. Would it go up the same rational way if your rate was, you know, it's 100%? Maybe not. And that's, you know, it might be an 80% of the, the rate percentage uh, applied to the value. But um, obviously, if the, the value of the investment goes up, rate follows in, in, in many ways. But having that conversation and planning ahead of times will help. Uh, mitigate that that risk really. Yeah, the rates uh, are Joanne are not linear. So in other words, uh, the higher the scheduled value, um, the rate. If there's upgrades done, it could relate to a, a, a significantly lower rate. Even though you're going to see a premium increase because you're now gone from 100 to 250 thousand in value, but it's based on again if you do addition to existing cabin. So if the value of that cabin's gone up to 250 thousand, you're going to pay more but it's not going to be at the same rate as it would have been for the hundred first hundred thousand that you paid the prior year. Yep. Yeah. And some of what I'm talking about is, um, is essentially like upgrades that, um, for example, somebody puts a, 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 the generator on their property so that if the power goes out, they're able to um, still run their business and therefore lessening their, their mitigation, mitigating their, their loss on, on loss of income because the property had to be closed down. Um, putting in, you know, throwing it, putting in a fire station on property um, so that if there was a fire, you immediately could put the fire out and again, mitigating your losses. So, you know, that's a completely something that um, I don't know that anybody would do, but uh, you know, are there things that you can do on your property that would lessen your liability and your, your risk for uh, claims? Oh, and would that, yeah. You always. know, would that be beneficial to somebody? Again, I mean, water like supply is always the concern is uh, availability of water to fight a fire. Um, the standard is 300 gallons per minute. Mm -hmm. That's considered hydrant protected. So if your water supply will allow you 300 gallons per minute for a sustained period of two hours, that is considered to be uh, hydrant protected. So if you can provide a fire pump that's got a dedicated generator assigned to it at your location, mm -hmm. once again, recognize your seasonal, if you can have that availability of water from May until October till you close down, that is going to definitely speak to the rating and uh, the, once again, the availability and limits of coverage. Right. So anything right. you can do on that perspective. My first job when I moved up to Northern Ontario was I was the inspector for Sun Alliance Insurance and if, Grace, you remember back in the day, Sun Alliance was one of the carriers on the NOLO program. So that's what was my, that was my job was to do inspections. Way back when. Jeremy, the, um, you're asking whether or not a small or medium resort should have five or 10 million liability. Um, that's obviously a conversation to have off site, depending on your activities, and your, your, um, your client services and that piece. My general uh, recommendation is is to look at the difference in the cost between five and 10 million. And if you can get 10 million, get the 10 million. Um, it also goes to the rating structure of liability. I, I, I won't throw out numbers, but the large majority of the percentage of the rate goes obviously with the first couple of million dollars. Everything as you get further and further away from say a 2 million or a 3 million or as it goes, gets cheaper and cheaper. So the difference between five and 10 million would, could be, uh, relatively inexpensive as it relates to the first um, 
the first five million, for example. Um, I would also encourage the opportunity, if it exists, to get an umbrella liability. If you had a five million dollar liability uh, underlying, the ability for you to go get five million dollars as an umbrella that would then extend over the auto other. Uh, the property, the um, water sports, depending on your operations, again, um, may or may not be a better solution to further the liability across the operations than just simply restricting it to, say, the property. So um, there are different ways of looking at the liability piece, but um, absolutely something uh, to consider. Corey, I, I'm, I'm getting some frustration on your end. I, I'm feeling as though you're probably someone who's been burned um, from the insurance industry. And unfortunately, they haven't been there to, to help you out in many ways. But uh, um, again, there, there aren't many defenses in, in, in ways for um, what you're talking about with the COVID standpoint and the loss of income uh, as it relates to that um, while not many people would have said necessarily, thank God for, inc uh, for insurance uh, during the pandemic, um, I've seen many countless times when there have been situations where it is, thank God for insurance. Um, and that I think speaks to, um, you know, the, the general purpose of insurance. And I, I mean, I, I think it gets misconstrued a lot where people put in very small claims or aren't having a, a, you know, an appropriate conversation about what those losses may be. But don't forget that insurance at the end of the day is there for the large losses. I'm not going to talk about COVID because we understand that that is an actual significant one in 100 um, situation, but insurance gets a lot of bad rap unless you know, the claims pay out um, if the claim is applicable and if the, uh, uh, if the coverage is explained pr proper, uh, appropriately and properly to you. But uh, I get the frustration, happy to have a conversation offline and and go through any of those types of things with you. And uh, the insurance industry as a whole has a lot of work to do to, to gain the trust of its clients. And I think that goes back to um, the transparency and the communication ability that we have to explain and, and, and help educate and make sure that we're there as a business partner and not just the you know necessity insurance broker. So happy to have that conversation. With that, I mean, we're, we're, uh, we've taken a lot of everyone's time this morning. Joanne, do you have any other questions of Bernie and I, Grace? I'll open that same thing to you before we, we wind down and uh, say our goodbyes and thank yous. Yeah, I sure, I do have one, sorry, Grace. No, um, no, go ahead. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and thank you for, for um, answering our questions. And I know there's a lot of, um, a lot of frustration on the one end for, for COVID. Uh, but, you know, moving forward, I know we've talked about, about um, looking at changing our renewal dates, looking at changing who our insurance broker is or who is providing insurance for us. And um, is it from your standpoint, I know, I know uh, you're business driven and, and you want to have as many clients as you can. Um, is it advisable if, if we as a business are looking for new insurance quotes, we're expecting our insurance broker to present us with some um, the best policies. Is it, uh, do you recommend that we pursue more than one insurance broker? Um, I know, yeah, I know Bernie, you're shaking your head no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, is, it, is that something is, you know, what if, you know, we're, we're kind of like grass is greener on the other side. What if there's another broker that can give us something that our current broker is not, uh, but we don't want to let go of that current broker because what if the other broker, you know, is it recommended to go with more than one broker and then decide which company you're going to go with, which broker and which insurance company? So it, it's important to understand the, the first to market piece that Bernie talked about earlier. My advice would be interview your insurance brokers. Do you, do you interview your investment advisor before you give them a bullet of money? Do you invest, you know, uh, interview your um, lawyer or accountant or anything like that before they do the work? Talk to them, find out what markets they have, how they plan on marketing your, your risks. How do they, what markets do they have? You know, have they ever been to Lloyd's of London? I know Bernie has, I haven't, um, but we have great connections there. Um, 
you're talking about a professional service provider. So there are many situations where in my life anyways, uh, and obviously I'm an advocate of, of brokers or mortgage brokers or real estate agents or, or, or um, there's not many situations where I don't advocate for the use of a professional, but you're going to, you have to feel a comfort with them. Understanding the process that if you go to the market right away, or if your current broker blocks off the markets, then that makes things a little bit more challenging, but absolutely have a conversation with multiple brokers if you want and understand what they can actually do for you. What are their payment terms? How do they propose changing your renewal terms? What markets do they have? How do they propose the risk management? Um, how do, how, do you, how do you propose that they're going to sell your account in the best way to the underwriters that gives you the most coverage and the most peace of mind at the end of the day from a business decision, but um, make sure you understand or that the brokers understand that you're going to, you're only going to give information to them and you only expect them to go to market once you have picked that broker. And when do you recommend doing that? <laughs> um, so typically, I mean, the more lead time before your renewal date is, is the best, obviously. Uh, so anywhere between 90 to 120 days out before your renewal is when we really get into the weeds and start making that presentation to the insurance companies. And given the, the, the challenge of the industry as a whole, um, the more time is better. But at any time that is suitable for your business. I mean, we may be 18 months out before we make a change, but the, the more we communicate throughout that time, the better opportunity I have to, and Bernie has, or our team has to advocate on your behalf and, you know, visit the risk, uh, visit your location. Um, we had one, one person in the chat say, I'm not sure our insurance broker even knows where we are. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> that's, that doesn't start well, obviously with the conversation, but um the more lead time, you may not be going to market this year. You may not have that, but there's a lot of things that people can not necessarily poke holes at. And that's not to, you know, dissuade or uh, um, disparage a, the former broker or, or potentially someone who you're looking to move on from. But, you know, there are options out there. And the more conversation you have, the ability for you to interview these people um, and understand what they do differently and how they propose to understand your risk first and foremost and then sell that risk to insurance companies that is that's of utmost importance excellent so we're interviewing our broker first and then letting them do the work for us getting the best pick your partner, man. Pick your partner. absolutely pick your partner uh, one last question from jeremy is do we think uh, moving forward resorts will have more or less underwriters willing to quote for us um it's a it's a challenging class. Without a question, there's a, a challenging class, and um, the capacity within the marketplace is there right now. But again, it comes down to who is selling that risk and understanding where they're going and what you guys are actually doing from operators to be able to accurately present that and have a, a strategy around what markets you're approaching. So um, it may not be. Uh, it's still not going to be the easiest class of business, given the operations, given the liability, given the questions and actually understanding that and explaining it to the underwriters. But there are opportunities and there are um, different markets always. Um, people who um, want to sink their teeth into this. So there are different opportunities, but uh, uh, I'll say we're not out of the woods yet on that one. So. With that, I want, to, uh, I want to thank Bernie. I want to thank Joanne and Grace for having us today and uh, all the help and the questions uh, from the audience. Um, we're looking forward to being part of Resorts Ontario and helping the operators um, and partnering with the operators to make sure that your risk management services are covered appropriately. Grace, again, thank you for your contributions to the, the association over the number of years. Congratulations on your upcoming retirement. And uh, I'm sure we'll. Uh, I'm sure the industry will uh, uh, won't 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 be too far for you. So. Oh,
Thanks, Matt. And I also wanted to thank uh, Bernie and Matt and, and Joanne. And then separately, Joanne and I really appreciated you participating today. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, your, your conversation with me sort of facilitated the, the, the birth of this session. And I think there were excellent tactics, lots of information, lots of considerations uh, with all the points made uh, as resorts move forward with our mandate. Uh, we are here to serve our members. So I think there could be an ongoing role in in terms of information through our newsletter. Um, things like waivers, they come up all the time. You know, members call me and say, well, can I have a waiver for this? And so when you look at the overall notion of, of exposure and risk, you know, there must be information we can bring forward to our membership. So again, thank you so much. We'll stay in touch. I'm still here till the end of June and I'm not leaving the planet, but thanks everyone for joining. We really appreciate that. Thanks, Grace. Thanks, Grace. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Take care. Bye now. Bye, Bye everybody.